Michelle Graves, your host on The Power of Money, and I'm honored to have you as a part of my world in this coming segment. With The Power of Money, as you know, we are interested in three things. First, that you get the necessary education so that you and your family will have the information to do well in these difficult times. The second thing I'm interested in is for you to be empowered to prosper. I want only the best for you, but you can't get that if you don't have the education and then the drive to make it happen. And the final thing, and perhaps the most important thing, is that you be energized because life is more than a journey. Life is about living. And so I want you to learn these things and to be empowered and encouraged and energized. I'm Michelle Gray. Now here we go. And here we go. Pow. Good to be here today. And I'm your host, Michelle Graves, affectionately known for the last 30 plus years as the money lady. And why? Because <laughs> I'm on it. Okay. I've lived it. I've done it. Blown up a couple of times. But there's some fundamental truths that I have on the inside. It's called wisdom that actually enable me to share with you openly without judging steps and strategies for you to handle your business better. By the way, you do know that your life is really about your business. And some people, whether they acknowledge it or not, are bankrupt because <laughs> they don't have anything. So their business is, didn't make it. Some people have an average business and some people have an extraordinary business where they're handling their affairs, they're making decisions as a family unit, uh, they are wisely uh, eliminating things that are not going to benefit the family unit. Why do I focus on the family unit? Because the family, the family is the most important thing going out here. It's not who's president, it's not where you work, it's not what you're doing on the side, it's not about the church you go to or don't go to, um, it's about your family, okay? Because everything in this earth revolves around in your younger years, what happened to you as a family member? You come to this earth with a DNA construct. You didn't have nothing to do with that, but that's still family because you are the product of 26 chromosomes on your daddy and 26 on your mother. So again, that's family because they got together and produced you. And so you come here with a DNA configuration that you did not control. But after that, it's all about where did you learn? How were you trained? It starts with your small family unit, your mother, your father, your sisters, your brothers, may extend outward to your aunties and uncles and cousins and kinfolks, as we say in Kentucky. But then you have your community, and that's where your values are codified. It could be your church, it could be your uh, neighbors, your neighborhood, where you grew up, the experiences you had that codify your outlook on life. This is major. Okay, this is so major because if you are the product of a community where you didn't see anybody who had anything going for them, I mean it, anybody other than pregnant girls and guys that were toting guns and acting crazy, then that is going to be your filter. That's what you're going to think about as you move ahead in life. You're going to think that everybody lives like this. If you came out of uh, sharecropping and all you grew up was seeing poor people and sharecroppers and people that uh, owed the store and, and fathers or mothers or both who were alcoholics and beating each other up, this is going to uh, frame your perspective about life. And believe me on the subject I'm going to be talking to you about now for this segment is without this foundation, you will not understand why you are doing what you're doing. And you will not know how to put a halt to the behavior 
because it is learned behavior. You behave that way because you learned it by watching, by being a part of it, by being involved. I read a, 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 an account this morning about Don Knox, who was Bernie Fife on the Andy Griffith show. And I just love, I just love Don Knox. He was hysterical. I mean, think about it. Comedian before you called him that. He just, everybody knows the Don Knox. I mean, whether you white, black, Latino, everybody knows the Don Knox, okay? Everybody. And it talked about his background and how Don Knox was the product of a mother who was 40 years old, married to a man who was a schizophrenic, had schizophrenia, uh, multiple personality syndrome. He was also an alcoholic. So Don Knox grew up not only watching his mother getting beat up all the time, but he had an older brother who emulated the father's behavior and beat him up all the time. And then he got beat up by the father too. And he grew up with this going on in his life. At 13 years old, his father died. And at 13 years old, he made some firm decisions about what he was or was not going to do in his life. Isn't that an amazing account? He's not the only person that's had horrible life-defining things happen in his life. And that's why he took to comedy to ease the pain, okay? The comedy, his, his reactions, his fa these are things that he mastered to deal with his pain from his horrible, horrible childhood. A childhood that he did not ask for. He was born into, okay? Now the reason I bring that up is because Don Knox did make a choice. He made a choice at a young age that my brother's not going to kick, continue kicking my butt. Uh, my dad's dead. Uh, my mother is a mess. And I've got to carve out my own life. And you do know that his life was a tough life. It was because he was a character comedian. And there weren't a whole lot of roles for a person like him to play. But he was able to master what he mastered through a very disciplined approach to being a character actor. And of course, Andy Griffith, that ran for many years and then some other shows. But my point in bringing this illustration is that everybody's life starts from something, okay? You come into this world, again, with two sets of chromosomes. And that's why I say to young girls all the time, you better be careful about who you're messing around with because that child is going to carry characteristics of his father or his mother uh, and, and you. You can't get around that. So there's no point in you being mad at the child. You can be mad at yourself because you did it, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of wisdom and insight so you will be careful as to what you bring into the world because it is real. This thing works efficiently. So we are born into these things in these situations which help to form a mindset that we have. And, and, and it's not arbitrary. It is simply not arbitrary at all. As you go through life and as you interface with so many different people, and the world is three billion humans that are all configured uniquely, differently, with different life stories and different life experiences. And this is what internet has done. It has leveled the playing field. We get to watch everybody do all kinds of stuff. And at least you now know that you're not the only person crazy because there are crazy people all over the world. This is ubiquitous, okay? It's everywhere. So why am I saying all this? Because the subject matter for this show today, given this mindset, that you know what you were born in, you know your background and behavior, so many of you that should have done better based upon your income, based upon college degrees, all the above, you should have done better. But as you grow older, you're looking more and more and more like your mother, like your father, like your family tribe, because you were influenced and shaped by that community and by that family. And that is why I put so much focus and emphasis 
on the family. I'm always looking at families when people sit down and want to talk to me about their situation. I have to look at families. I have to ask questions. They don't know why I'm asking those questions, but I'm trying to get a sense of what did you learn that has branded your brain in a certain way and that has been a uh, adversary actually to you accomplishing and achieving your goals. Let me give you an illustration and then I'm going to go to what I'm dealing with today. Very successful man, African American, very successful on paper, all credentials, all the above, very. No reason in life that he should not be wealthy. No reason, notwithstanding racism and all the other isms, the fact is that he has the credentialing and the degrees that say he should be way ahead of the bandwagon, particularly now that he is older and he can look back over the course of his life. And there are patterns and red flags that told me that his end is exactly the way it was in the beginning. At his age, he has almost zero. He has no retirement, he has no real estate, he has very little in savings, and he has a perspective on life that's really skewed. Well, if you do the background research on that individual, you will find out that that person was raised in abject poverty, uh, had a alcoholic father who abused the mother, who was clearly a gifted woman, but this was her fate in that time in history. So he grew up in an environment where he never was valued. The things that he grew up and saw as normal for him were normal, but actually were not normal. Um, and he, despite all of his accomplishments, remained a person disconnected from other people. Superficially, he had mastered the skills that were necessary to take him where he needed to go. But in the end of his life, he ended up exactly where he started out. Isn't that something? He wasn't a sharecropper, but he had no money. He was not, um, um, how do I say, multiple marriages, was not successful in intimacy. Why? His father was a jerk and a loser, and that's the imprinting that went on him. Now, you can say, and you have every right to your opinion, well, he could have done better. He could have done like Don Knox. Well, let me just share with you. Don Knox was in therapy for most of his life because he had the money to get therapy. He was in therapy for most of his life to deal with those devils that followed him over the course of his life that made him aloof and distant with his family members and focused on his work. And constantly joking, joking because the pain was deep. Now, I'm going to share with you the topic because this is all a prelude to what I'm talking about today, which is I'm in debt, folks. I'm not talking about me. This is a subject. I'm in debt and I'm drowning and I don't know how. I don't know how I got this way. And the subject today is get out of debt now. Get out of debt now, N-O-W. I'm not giving you a choice on this. I'm giving you a directive. Get out of debt now. Now let me give you a backdrop here. I've given you a mindset backdrop so you could understand. If you came from a family where they never had any money, they were always scraping, folks were always doing stuff on the slide, uh, meaning not legal, uh, to keep things going. Uh, you came out of families where there was uh, dysfunctionality, meaning uh, mental illness, father alcoholic, mother alcoholic, depression, all those things that shaped and molded your perspective as a child, which is you grew up believing that this was how everybody else lived. 
You didn't think this was unique to you where you never saw anybody save for anything, where you never saw a pattern of saving for anything, why, where you grew up seeing the tax refund immediately being spent on stuff, cookies as I call them, shoes, clothing, hair, um, maybe a, a, a car, a little dumpy car or something. When you grew up with that and your mindset is that everybody in your community lived like that, even if they didn't, that's your perspective as a child. So that became codified in your brain, which is the best I have to bring to this earth is very little. And all the braggadocia and all the, oh, look at me, is nothing. It fails in the face of my truth. What happened to me, what's beleaguering me, what's chasing me like a demon, these things are still very real to me. That's why I'm giving you a directive today. I'm not giving you a choice. I'm giving you a directive because the brain responds to directives. So the directive today is to get out of debt now. Now, N-O-W, now. You say like, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean? I'm trying to tell you something and I mean for you to do it because we live in a culture and a society where your indebtedness makes other people richer. You're having nothing and owing out the little that you bring in that was used to buy nothing has empowered people who don't care nothing about you or your family, okay? I sat and watched television, which I rarely do, and for those of you that do, look, it's America, do whatever, but I um, have a little antenna box and I watch television on occasion. Most of my news and information actually comes by way of my iPhone and I'm okay with that or Netflix, I'm even better with that and for those of you more sophisticated, Roku, I don't do that yet, I'm still on baby steps, but I watched advertising and I watched so many advertisements about buying a car. Buying a car, leasing a car, and this is all by design because it's tax time. And people are rushing out to get their tax refunds, which is money you let the government use for an entire year, and then you file to get back what was yours to begin with. What's that about? Well, it's for savings. What about putting it in a bank? Why would you give the government your money, particularly given how they're spending it? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. What's going on here? But I watched for a solid, I'm going to say four hours. I sat down and I just started scripting all of the ads for cars. And, and some of them were budget friendly, meaning you could buy a car for $199 a month plus a down payment. Or some of them were more pricey, the Jaguars and the Beamers and whatnot. But the point is, is that when I looked at the terms for buying the car, and particularly a lease, what do you really think that car is going to be worth in five years? I mean, really? What do you really think you will have paid out in five years? for that car that's not yours. And sadly, the only people a lease works for are people that own their own businesses because that car can be written off as a business expense. But for the average American who's driving it around to sport and show, as I say, what is that accruing? And, and I know the ads are successful because any marketing person will tell you if you inundate people at least seven times, they're going to do it. They're going to do it because that's how gullible humans are to media. 
So they're running around. Oh, I got to get this car. I got to get this car. Well, in five years, what will you have to show for this car? Other than you got to turn it in and you're going to owe money because you went way over the limits. Or even if it's a three year, you've t you're, 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 you're in the hole. So why am I bashing cars today? Because it's about a psychology. It's about a mindset that we as a people in this country have been bamboozled. Is that the, is that the term today? Bamboozled. Into thinking that you have to have this car. And believe me, manufacturers have no problem with framing a marketing a campaign to inundate you so that you will buy this car that you can't afford. And why do I say can't afford? Because you really can't. Because at the end of the day, what do you have to show for it? You have a car, four wheels, an ignition, a steering wheel, yeah, and boom. And I'm going to tell you something. The millennials, these are the young people, they're not buying it. They're doing Uber. Oh, what is Uber for those who are not Uber savvy? Uber is a modern day taxi cab <laughs> that'll take you anywhere in 24 hours a day, nonstop. And you pay them via your credit card, which is automatically deducted when you get out the car. It's so, it's so sweet, it's, it, and, and they have another company, Lyft. So there are two companies that are global companies that do this. So you say, why would I pay a taxi cab? And I'm gonna tell you why, because it's cheaper than a car. <laughs> you don't drive that car 24 hours a day, but you have to pay insurance on that car, you have to pay maintenance on that car, you gotta take care of the car, or else it's gonna break down. And you have to keep the car looking good on the exterior because radiation damage is real on cars. So many of our young people, particularly in larger cities, they don't even do cars. They do trains, buses, and Uber. And I must tell you, I was not an Uber fan until I did Uber when I went to visit my daughter in New York. I mean, nobody was driving cars. They was flipping around in these, they look like cars, they regular people driving cars making extra money. So you say to yourself, huh, what's that about? I need a car. If I want to go someplace, I can just call a Uber. I can just get in my car and start and drive. But is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? And I'm just saying this, which is why my subject today is get out of debt now. That's, that's a demand, that's a command. Interpret it any kind of way you want. But I'm gonna put on that blacklist, new cars. Now, I don't have a thing about older cars. I really don't. Why? Because they've depreciated out. You can pay for them cash from saving your money and you're done with it. Can I afford a brand new car? Of course, of course. But I drive a 2001 Honda, which is paid for, obviously, in excellent condition. No kidding, I can afford it. And I ditched my Lexus for this one. Why? Because, hello, I did not need the Lexus headache. You ever try to repair a foreign car? and start adding that up, it made me want to become a foreign car mechanic, okay? Now, again, the issue of car ownership works best for people who have their own businesses. The rest of us, you need not to be doing that, okay? You really don't, and frankly, I, I'm amazed at how successful the marketing ads are, are going. And, and how many millions of people are buying cars. And of course, the car dealers are pushing them. Uh, they're, they're doing credit that, you know, for people that should not 
own a car, okay? Because a car is, again, a monthly payment. So let's talk about debt and why debt will shut you down and send you backwards. I'm not trying to appeal to your intellect, by the way. I'm trying to appeal to your pain because your intellect would tell you, you don't need to do this. That's the, that little white, white little angel floating around in right ear. The left ear is a little red angel saying, you need to do it because you, you got it going like that. Let everybody know you got it going like that. And I'm like, whatever you had going is going to be gone as your money moves from your pocket to somebody else called business. You don't want to take care of your business. Nobody's going to stop you except me today because I'm saying get out of debt now. Most people like, hey, do you, but they're not going to be there when you is gone. <laughs> you can't make the payments. You've lost your job. They downsized you. You've tried to retire and you can't retire because you don't have enough money. But you're doing you. And again, not me to judge, but as the money lady, my commitment is to show you how you've been bamboozled so you can take the steps to say, I'm done. And for the record, it is hard because I was saying the other day, geez, I need a new car. And I had to smack myself and say, based on what? Based on what? You fly wherever you go, you rent a car when you get there. If you're in a big city, you Uber everywhere. And so what do you need a new money-sucking car for? Ego, ego, because I'm all that. No, you're not. You're soon to be broke and impoverished because you didn't respect debt and what it looks like. The Bible admonishes us to, get, to not do debt, period. Why? Because it's a form of slavery. Why is it a form of slavery? At the point your check is already spent, you're in bondage. You're working a job to pay the debt. So I have some real strong feelings about that. Uh, how do I feel about buying a home? I'm going to say this because I owned a mortgage bank. I put thousands of people into homes throughout Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky for almost 20 years. I know what I'm talking about. And I drank the Kool-Aid. Yes, I did. Which is, this is the American dream. Not true. It's the American dream for the bank. But it's not the American dream for you. And the only way it becomes an American dream is number one, that it is incredibly affordable, also known as cheap real estate, okay? That you can easily all allocate no more than 20% of your monthly net. I didn't say gross. I know how to underwrite. I know the numbers we use. I'm saying for you, 20% of your net is devoted to your mortgage, your homeowner's insurance, and your real estate taxes. Your mortgage would be your principal and, int and interest. Oh, did I say interest? What is interest? Interest is where your money goes because you didn't have the money to pay for the house cash. So the bank says, I, I'll make this loan to you, but you gotta pay me interest. And the first thing you're gonna say to me is money lady, but I'm only paying 4%. You better, you better read your closing documents <laughs> and see what that loan really cost you. Unless you were smart and bought a home at a deep discount, and yes, they're still around, you just have to be patient. You're going to be paying a lot of money for a long time to someone else who is not a part of your family. So you can't even keep the money in the family. It's moving outside. So you say, but I got to live somewhere and I don't want to pay rent. Well, you know what? You choose your battles, not me. 
And if you're out here frisking around, the decision you have to make is, if I want to do a home, how much do I want to pay? How much am I willing to do this loan for? Because most people book a 30-year loan. That's 30 years of the bank collecting interest, okay? That's called amortization. That's on your closing docs, by the way. And do you want to shorten it so that you can be out of this hole soon? Or do you want to live the American fantasy? And I say fantasy because unless you really understand how this system works, and that is that it's all about taking from those who have nothing, extracting through creating false desires, false wants and needs, so that they can take your money. That's how I look at everything, by the way, which is you can't have my money, and I'm not going to let you take it, and if I give it to you, that's on me, okay? That's on me. Now, the exception, of course, is if you're a believer in tithing and offering, which I am, and that's different because that's God, and it has nothing to do with humans. But for everybody else, you're not getting my money unless I want to give it to you. And you got to show me a good cause reason for why I should. Okay. Or else you don't get my money. Okay. And that is my philosophy. I'm not saying you should embrace it, but it might be wise if you did. Okay. There are some essentials that you cannot get around before you start talking about debt. And I'm speaking to young people now, which is you're coming out of college with tons of student debt. Tons. I mean, your student debt is the cost of a house. And it's tied into the federal government, so you can't bankrupt. You've got to pay it. So how do you pay it? You pay it. You work your jobs. You live modestly. You do what other young people are doing. You couch with your parents. Or, and I know parents, you're not happy to see this, but they did the debt. They could have had you as a co-signer. Some of them did, which means they don't pay. You got to pay. So help them to get out of this mess. You don't talk about getting married because to get married means more money. Marriage is expensive. And so there you are. Getting out of college with all that debt does not mean you buy a car. It means that you learn the art of saving and paying your debt. You will be struggling for a long time. You will not be buying clothing for a long time. But here's the uptick. Clothing in America is so cheap. Thank you, China. Niama. It's so cheap. You already know. You can go to the Wish app. You can go to Chinese manufacturers that buy a dress for $5. I'm talking about knockoff city. Easy. Sometimes shipping is a dollar. The clothing thing is no big deal. Stay out of the big box stores because all they're doing is taking the manufacturer's stuff and jacking it up and selling it to you. Okay, but you're smarter than that. So you don't have to do that. You can live actually below your means. And, and I'm going to say this over and over and over again. I'm not the only person who's been talking about debt for 30 years. There are other people who are very well known and very well established who've built entire organizations on living a debt-free life. And their testimonies are awesome. You can Google and, and, and you'll see a lot more than I'm going to say today. But I'm saying to you, it starts with your mindset when you come out of college, which is nobody owes me anything, but I owe, <laughs> I owe everybody everything, including your parents who were with you when you did this, for many of you. Now, when you go through those early years, which are foundational years, you begin to make choices. And some of, uh, some of those folks that come out the gate from college or whatever, the first thing they do is, I deserve this. Where did that come from? I'm, I'm so serious. Where did I deserve this come from? Who told you that? They lied. Yeah! They lied. 
You don't deserve anything, period, including the right to life. That's somebody else's gift to you. But you do have a responsibility. That's the difference between deserving and a responsibility. If you say to yourself, I eat out every night because I deserve it, I will say to you that you're very irresponsible and that lifestyle is going to bring you to the end. Okay, first thing, you're, you're buying food you can't afford because you're too lazy to cook it. That's called an undisciplined life. Okay, and furthermore, restaurant food never tastes as good as home food, ever. I, I so dislike eating out now. I've traveled, I've eaten everything, but there's nothing like a home-cooked meal. I mean like chicken and rice with a real chicken, okay, a real organic chicken. Uh, with some green beans that grew in the garden. And just, I mean, yummy, yummy, cornbread. Yeah, that kind of food. Stick to your ribs, healthy food. Spending like that already says your consciousness, your mindset says I deserve it. Not that I have a responsibility to take care of myself responsibly. Then... I must speak it because it's real, real serious. Credit cards, credit card companies are looking for you while you got good credit. So college kids, there you go. Boom. Anybody that has a credit card today, other than for getting an airplane for which you're reimbursed by your company or you've budgeted for a vacation because airlines don't take cash. I think some of them take PayPal. It's just ludicrous. Why do you have a credit card? Well, because I want to get things. Well, here it comes back to this. I deserve it. And the credit card is a big sucker of your money in the form of interest. Ask your parents who can't get out of debt. What happened and why they're paying on bills from purchases they made eight years ago? Because it's a racket. And it works. Okay, it works. So if you are in credit card debt and your tax returns are coming, this year I want you to take the hit and pay off your credit card debt. Or at least at the very minimum, make a serious push to get it paid off. Reason being, is that banks work under the assumption that people aren't that bright and that you'll be paying them forever. And by the time you reach retirement, when you really need money, not credit, money to live on, you're, you're just sinking in debt, okay? Let me give you a statistic, young people and old people. When people retire, the data suggests that They only have $25,000 saved up. I believe that. They have depleted all their money. Some of them, if they're fortunate, may have pensions, not many. Most are counting on Social Security to get them through the day. And I got news for you. That's not going to get you through the day or the night (laughs) or the next day. Because when you get older, other things begin to pop up, like your health, right? Because Medicare doesn't pay for all your health issues. It doesn't, there's a deductible, and then there's additional expenses, and then there's a cap. And so, God forbid, you get sick, or you're chronic, meaning you don't get well. And the money you've accumulated is now taking a one-way trip to the hospital to the doctor for paying for this, paying for, this is real stuff. I deal with this every day in my private practice, okay? It is so painful for me to sit down and look at people who cannot retire and retired. They retired and they're not even eligible for Medicare. So now they've got to pay for their health care out of their own pockets. And they are just done because they don't have the money to carry the premiums. So what happened? Well, if you look over their lifestyle and you look over the decisions they made starting as young people in their foundational years, 
What did they do? They made a decision that I work hard and I deserve this. And mistake number one. You work hard and you have a responsibility to be responsible for whatever you've earned. That's what you have a responsibility to. You have a responsibility to learn how money works. In your foundational years, while you're still evolving, while you're still learning about the power of choosing to live and to live responsibly and to live carefully, you're making decisions about who you're going to marry with the understanding that if they don't have the same mindset that you do, that's going to be a problem known as divorce or misery. But either way, you won't move forward. It is a statistical fact that the more people that divorce, the less money they have accumulated. Divorce is expensive. It is. Cheaper to keep her, cheaper to keep him. Thinking carefully from the, in those foundational years of 19 years old to 30. What do I want to do with my life and what does it need to look like? And I'm responsible. I don't deserve. I'm responsible. And then as you move from 30 to 50 into your accumulation years, where you're beginning to accumulate. And that means eliminating things that take your money. Like I said, I don't give my money away. Are you kidding me? I need my money. Okay? Money is a tool. It's not a god. That's horrible. You don't worship money. But you do recognize that money is a key and it opens up many doors for you. So your key thing is as a person who owns your business responsibly is your business that you're not going to let money zoom out the door unless you have a clarity. Now, if you have businesses and you're doing your own stuff as a business, you're always going to get my do it, do it, do it as long as you're profitable, not a hobby. Profitable. If you write off for profitability, if you're taking your money from a job and you're using it to do a business, you get my kadoos because your business is going to be your future and your retirement, not your job. But a business is harder than a job. I am not kidding you. Many nights I sat in my offices looking at payroll, looking at crazy employees, looking at myself like, ah, and wondering. And I'm telling you, a business is harder than working for someone else. And if you are a business owner, you had better, you had better learn right up front. The write off on taxes is great, but you better put aside money for yourself. Always. That business better be cranking out money or else you don't need to be in business. That's too much work to not make any money. It just is. So again, I'm pro-business, pro-entrepreneurship, and pro-profitability because that's your responsibility. Okay, you have to make that happen. From age 50 to 72 is your preservation years. Okay, which is hopefully you are now moving into a phase where you have a nest egg that is enviable, where you are beginning to see the fruits of your responsible living and where you can begin to make serious decisions about how you want to live your life. Because if you blow it at this time, meaning, I mean it, if you blow it at this period called preservation, and you choose to live your life like you're a 30 year old, they call those kind of people old fools. Yeah, they do. They're like, you gotta be kidding me. He's old school and he's still doing that. Okay, preservation means looking at your life, your assets, the things you've accumulated, which is I need to preserve these because I got to live on these. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know how much money I'm going to need to live. And those are preservation years. And finally, over the age of 72, these are your golden years. They should be your golden years. You've got grandchildren, hopefully. You've got money in the bank money and, and, and assets, you are living a life that reflects 
careful, responsible decision making in your younger years. It's just simply hard. And I know when I say get out of debt now, that the majority of seniors that are watching this show who have homes, you got homes with mortgages on them. And God knows, I don't know how you're going to make it because a mortgage is a noose around your neck when you're older. House got problems, taxes going up, fixed income, and you can't sell the house because the house is in such disrepair for some of you. Others of you, you've mortgaged, refinanced, more debt, more debt, and now you find out that when you need money out of this house, you can't get it. Why? Because you owe more than the house is worth or because you have put more in the house than the house should have had to begin with. And here you are. Okay. And it's nice to say, but my grandchildren need a place to, to visit. Take them to the park. Okay. Grandchildren are your least of your concerns. You got to take care of you. I'm very serious about that. You got to take care of you. So back to my subject matter, get out of debt now. Pay off your house fast, scrape and scrimp, shop diligently and carefully. Okay. Become a coupon fiend, become a discount fan. Watch how you're spending your daily money on junk food and eating out. Your stomach should be the stock market. You'd be rich. Don't buy cars unless they are at least three years old. And do not ever do a lease unless you own a business and you can cash flow and pay for it. Okay? Credit cards, nah, except for 30-day payoff. You're traveling, you've budgeted. Unfortunately, hotels and airlines, they want that plastic, but you don't have to be a prisoner to that plastic. Pop it in, pop it out, and move it on. What about other installment things? Well, I'm going to tell you again, when you do a good budget, you budget for those things. You budget for a roof. You budget for things you're going to have to do. It's a part of your life. You have to budget responsibly. Um, Dave Ramsey who I admire and appreciate on so many things. And we started out at the same time. He's been hard on debt. And I'm glad because it's the beginning and the end for most people. It really is. And if you can't afford it, then do like the old people did in the day. If you couldn't afford it, you just didn't buy it. You just didn't buy it. Are you saved enough until you could afford it? Because nothing out here is as precious as your peace of mind. And the downside of debt is debt collectors, <laughs> which is when you can't afford it, boy, those buzzers click on, including your house, okay? Including your house. And this is one of the tragedies in America of home ownership. If you've been faithful to pay your mortgage for all your life and you wind up running late, they can foreclose on your house and take it. Now that is a travesty and a tragedy, but it's perfectly legal contractually. Read the paperwork you sign before you go to closing. I tell this to people all the time, particularly when I owned a mortgage bank. You better be reading those closing. Oh, we trust you. Excuse me. These loans are going to the federal government. And, and it's not about trust, it's about handling your business and paying an attorney if you need to, to review your documentation. Why do I say all of this again? Is because you don't deserve anything, but you have to be responsible for everything that has your name on it or you in it. It's kind of like the expression I use all the time, which is, my name is Bennett. And I'm not in it. <laughs> so don't bring it to my table if I am not in it, on it, sign something. I'm not interested. So again, I don't want this presentation to be ill-conceived as, oh, Miss Graves in a bandwagon. This is not a bandwagon. At some point, you're going to get old. And many of you already are. And you don't have the money on the reserves 
to do anything. You don't have life insurance. You don't have adequate health insurance. And in the end, America's going to give you a big fat kiss and say, next. That's the harsh truth. And so I'm going to give it to you, as my girlfriend said, straight with no chaser. And just hopefully jar some of you into the reality of make that hard commitment. Sit down as a family unit and make some decisions. You can go on internet and you can get involved again in getting budgets and how to fill them out and how to make them happy. My specialty is 50 years and older. I don't get involved with young people anymore. I used to, but I don't. And this is where I am now. I, you know, I do insurance and I do in all that kind of stuff uh, for people that are retiring or approaching retiring because this is where the mess really is. So it's got to start somewhere. And I'm saying that it starts with our young people. It starts with their awareness and them ordering their steps more carefully. Um, the Bible says the poor shall always be with us. That's what Jesus Christ said. But let me just be clear with you. It doesn't have to have your name on it. You know, he didn't have to be talking to you. Don't start doing associations, which is, you know, my family's poor, I'm poor, and Jesus said the poor. He wasn't talking to you, so why do you embrace that? He's making a general claim statement, which is people that are foolish who have the end result of no money, no assets, no anything, will always be with us. And that's the truth. That is an absolute truth. But it doesn't have to have your name on it because you can take the proper steps to move ahead and to get your life in order and take my television show today as your wake up call, get it right, get it now, and just say the money lady told me that. And I don't want to hear it. And I was like, oh, just next. And I'm here to tell you, but you are going to hear it because I love you. Yeah, I love you. I don't want to see anybody in America going down for the count. And, and, and people are going down for the count all over the place. All you got to do is get in the, on the highway and look at all the fabulous cars that will be worth nothing, nothing in three years. Okay? And then say to yourself, how are they making it? And my answer is, that's not the question you should be asking. It's not how are they making it. The question is, how am I making it? And how's my family making it? And are my children balanced? And are they growing up in an environment where they see balance and responsibility? When they understand that rewards come to those who prepare for them? That nothing is accidental? That positivity means nothing if you're operating in a negative culture, in a negative climate. It just doesn't. It works when you're around people that are moving positively and forward, not negatively and backwards. You better know the difference, okay? Because there is an end game on this whole thing, which is why I'm here today. I reach out to you. If any of you are over 50 and would like to do better, I challenge you to give me a phone call, 513-237. 3914. 513-237-3914. And yes, I do answer my phone, not my secretary. I answer my phone. If you'd like to reach out to me by email, which many of you already do, it's mygraves at gmail. Or you can always, if you're a Facebook person, you can always reach me on Facebook and ask me what I would recommend. Again, this is me talking to you direct, straight, and personal, and I hope you've benefited. And as always, in concluding today's show, I wish you peace, which surpasses all wealth, peace of mind, where you are not at enmity or at war with anyone, where you can embrace your God without any complaints or sorrow. I send you love because that's all I can give you. It's just to love you. I may not even like you, but I'm compelled to love you because we both come out of the same background, Adam. We all do. We all got mess and we all got issues, but you can overcome. You can do better. 
You will do better when you take the necessary steps. And finally, I bless you. I bless you. I want you to prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. I'll see you the next time. Today's topic, get out of debt now. See you soon.